Hey everyone, welcome to the Sneaker History Podcast, where we dive into the people, stories, and iconic moments that have helped make sneakers a global phenomenon. If you've ever told someone that you like their kicks, then you're in the right place. Before we lace up this episode, here's a little teaser for you. Stick around to the end of each episode for the last shot question. It's a chance to test your sneaker knowledge and engage with our community. I've also recently started a newsletter to share my knowledge from nearly two decades of experience working in the footwear industry. You can find the link to that below or go to sneakerhistory.com slash newsletter for a weekly deep dive into the biggest topics in the sneaker business. All right, now that the business is taken care of, grab your favorite pair of kicks and let's get started with the episode. Welcome to another episode of the Sneaker History Podcast. You're chilling with two Seattle dudes, a guy, a girl, and a pizza place. I was like, I'm going to do a show. (laughs) How's everybody doing today? I'm good. I'm excited that I get to play with the Ryan Reynolds of the sneaker content world and <laughs> Robbie Falke. So how are you, Robbie? No. Man, I'm here. I'm here with Denzel of the sneaker content. How's Mike? I'm good. I'm, you know what? I'm still recovering from our, our latest Bluey episode. I don't know Roy can, uh, can sympathize with me here, but I'm good, man. I'm good. Mike. You had Bluey. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I for me, I have not had a more sorry spoiler alert. And never thought I'd have to say that about Bluey on a sneaker podcast. This is probably the most ambiguous ending I've seen since The Sopranos, and I'm on pins and needles. But luckily for us, there was no fade to black. It was a tasteful shot where we were able to see the Healer family go back into the house that they thought they sold. But that's for another podcast. Double I am bit. excited. Speaking of powerful women, what is the show about today, Robbie? Yeah, I mean, Bluey might have a lot of cross content here. There might be some parents listening, some moms, some dads. I know many of these athletes we're going to be discussing are moms, uh, especially the first one. She's always on court in New York Liberty games. But we're talking about female WNBA kicks. You know, Caitlin Clark, biggest talk of the world, right, right now. Um, She had signed an eight-figure deal with Nike that is supposedly going to include... A signature shoe yeah. something we all kind of thought was going to happen right not like the biggest bomb to drop in the sneaker world but it got us thinking about other females other ladies other moms hoopers ballers in the WNBA before caitlin who have had <laughs> signature shoes so brianna stewart right um yep. cutest daughter ever at all the games at all her mom's games it's a1 content make sure you check that out on tiktok or instagram but um she's had a Puma deal now. They're on the third signature sneaker. She was actually the first lady to have a signature shoe in more than 10 years before the Stewie one came out. So starting in 2022 to now, um, the Stewie three just came out. All very similar shoes, but super cool. I'll leave that there. What do you guys think about Stewie, the shoe? I just think the shoe's cool. I mean, Puma's been putting out a solid product. I mean, between, you know, what they do at NBA, they do with just kind of general basketball, of course. Uh, mm-hmm. Stewie's shoe, I think she has a, you know, it falls in line to those, you know, look, sleek looking, very high performing shoes that Puma's doing. I haven't tried them out personally. I still actually want to get a pair of those to compare it against the uh, um, Mellows, just kind of see kind of, you know, differences and some of the other stuff as well. But I think they're pretty cool. I like them. <laughs> For me, I think with Stewie, the thing I didn't realize, and I'm fortunate because one of my coworkers has a daughter who's a very high-profile NCAA recruit that is actually ironically heading to Iowa, so full circle moment as it compares to Caitlin Clark. And what I was being told in the last couple of years is Stewie has really kind of taken on the grassroots movement, and that's kind of become the unofficial shoe of high school girls everywhere. And so for me... It's been really interesting to see through that lens, if you will, because that's a world I have no exposure to. Now, if my kid happens to get a miraculous growth spurt, maybe in 15 years I can hopefully have an opinion on the Stewie 18 at that point. But it's been (laughs) one of those things where I'm glad we're living in the golden era of sports equality because we get to get an exposure to something like this. Because previously, this would have been very much a niche topic and we wouldn't have had any sort of topic around this, let alone on a much listened to podcast like this one. Yeah, exactly. And we're getting closer to an era that we could call golden. I always like to think of that distinction because we still got to get better. Things are going to get better. But we're we're on the golden, the yellow brick road, so to speak, of women's sports right now. So we're on the right road. We're not we're not at the castle yet, but that road's looking good. Stewie is is a wizard, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to segues. (laughs) Stewie is also a wizard. You know, this whole NCAA women's tournament got me looking back. 
especially ESPN and their t- dual cast simulcast with Tarasi and bird having all these other women come on and just be featured on the episodes. Um, Stewie is kind of like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar when it comes to like college four for four NCAA championships. You know how Ridiculous. insane that is. Ridiculous. Um, <laughs> Like Stewie, and she has a WNBA championship. She has multiple Russian Turkey championships. God knows she has a high school championship. I'm not looking at it right now, but I, <laughs> I, I have to think you don't go four for four in sure college. She does. And, yeah. What's but, the level of championship she doesn't have? Like, did she get beat out yeah, when she was in fourth grade? Ask. Yeah. Um, I mean, Olympic gold, there's literally Rec league, I don't <laughs> nothing she doesn't have. And I didn't know about that grassroots, you know, high school connection that makes me really happy though because she's one of the super duper ballers this period like goat level of resume already she's this thing about going four for four for four in a modern era you know back in the day college you know think 1960s that would happen not all the time right it's not a normal thing though but but people stuck around more you know Mm -hmm. but four for four is in freaking sane um So Stewie Goat, man, it's crazy. So uh, in one of her contemporaries, her signature shoe dropped the exact same year as the Stewie one after the Stewie one, though. So we can't say it was the first shoe in a little bit over a decade. But um, <laughs> Elena Deladon and the Air Dawn, pardon me, the Air Deladon 2, pardon me, got that all backwards. Nike Air Deladon, period, 2022 <laughs> is when it came out. A little tongue-tied. Um but I remember this story when she was getting drafted. They really, I've watched the WNBA draft for that long, people. Um, her sister Lizzie was featured um, throughout that coverage. And her shoe, um, Elena's, has Fly East Tech. It's designed to help anybody, um, you know, of any, right? I mean, any it's, level. I, it's one yeah, of those right? things that we want to make sure we skirt the line very carefully. I'm hopefully disability is not too derogatory of a term. If it is, I'll take full ownership of making an outdated accessibility. Account. Accessibility is perfect. To everyone. But anyway, to Robbie's point as well, if you know about Elena Deladonna, you know Lizzie is a big pillar of her mythology, right? I believe Elena Deladonna was at UConn for three years, and then his her senior year, rather, she went back home to Delaware, if I remember correctly, Correct. because she wanted to be close to her sister. And the bond that she has with her sister has made its way through her sneaker. And it's one of those things that we're big fans and big proponents of accessibility, whether it be in the literal shoe, but also accessibility to the sneaker culture. And I think that was probably one of the most positive stories we had recently seen because it was truly one of those things that a lot of people talk about it, but not that many are about that life. And we were able to see, once again, the women having a flexibility with regards to their brand that they can do something like that, where they can make that a hallmark of the shoe. Whereas I think if it would have been a men's athlete, like let's use Devin Booker, right? I believe his sister has a condition as well. If we're lucky, we get a sister colorway that maybe has that fly at ease accessibility, but it's not going to be a part of the actual shoe itself. Not as yeah. every single colorway of every single skew of every single model. So once again, hats off to Elena Deladonna and Nike Basketball at that point, because that's truly the joy of watching women's basketball sneaker culture evolve to the same levels as the men. You know, just the input they have. I mean, yeah, you can tell just from like from Ella Deladon's or any of them, you'll see there's a lot of input that they have. They're really close to the project because be, since this is not something that's happened in you know, such a long time, having a signature shoe for a, a woman's basketball player, I feel like they want to make sure they get it right, not only for the, you know, oh, okay, technology, great, but also to really get behind the character and the, and, you know, Rowan said it so eloquently, the mythology of the person. So whether it be, you know, referencing her family like Lizzie or will it be, I know that going back to Stewie, she has a colorway that is for the daughter. Is it the red, the Ruby is that her daughter? If, if, I don't want to mm-hmm. make that up, but I know she has a color dedicated to her daughter, but things like that. There's all these different things that they put into their shoes. And we'll even see some things with other players later where they're very have these really like significant personal touches. Seems like facts. And you can have full length air and zoom and fly ease. You don't have to have the fly shoes be a gimmick, right? That shoe can't yeah. be a gimmick. It's it's underselling the athlete wearing it. Um, mm-hmm. So the fact that it's a full-on baller shoe helps. Another yeah. baller shoe, another year after, Sabrina, <laughs> the Sabrina one. I know one of Rowett's favorite shoes of the last couple of years. 
go ahead and wax poetic one more time on that for us. <laughs> no, I mean, at this point, everything I'm going to say has been a bullet point on your favorite news media article, right? I believe ESPN and Sports Illustrated are essentially trading articles about why it's the most popular shoe, not only in the WNBA, but in the men's game as well. And I think for us, it's a, I jokingly refer to it as the Kobe five and a half, because that to me <laughs> is where the aesthetic falls exactly. But at the same time, it also has become a lot of people's favorites because of the colorways. It's the storytelling. And it's one of those things that I will defer to one of you guys as I have a toddler chatting to me right now. But it is one <laughs> of those things where we go back to the mythology, right? We have Sabrina with a slushy. We have the duck colorway so prevalent because that's how she kind of broke into the national scene. I'm sure we'll get a Raiders colorway shout out to Robbie's favorite football team because her <laughs> fiance is on the offensive line. And it's one of those things where the storytelling feels genuine and it doesn't feel artificial or ham fisted. And I think that is what's kind of comparing it to popularity. Now I will say one drawback of the Sabrina one, and it's kind of ironic given the fact that they've used so much of Sabrina's early childhood as kind of the framework of her story. We didn't see any sort of kid sizing run for the Sabrina one. And that's something that I feel you left money on the table. And it's very easy for me to say that because I'm not in Nike basketball. I don't know what the inner workings of the politics are behind the brand. But it would just make too much sense for me that if you are truly trying to grow the game, you're trying to make it more accessible, not only for little boys, but little girls. That should have been the number one priority. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you. That's definitely one of the things they should really really look at uh just the kid sizing but i'll say something i like about the sabrina and not to go off on a side tangent here but in a nike basketball lineup that is pretty vanilla right now in the sense of aesthetic everything looks pretty similar i feel like the sabrina stands out amongst a lot of those even like with things like the gt cut uh gt hustles your your um you know your LeBrons. i mean you're gonna have your LeBrons, but i feel like sabrina's shoe stands out i almost feels like and you guys correct me if, if i'm off base here but i feel like it almost it filled that void that was left when Kyrie left i feel like the sabrina really kind of fits into that that hole because now you like Roy said there's a lot of nba players wearing them there's a lot of just everyday players wearing them so i feel like with Again, with that with that hole that Kyrie left when he went to do his thing with Anta, I feel like Sabrina actually filled in that place, which is awesome. Seeing that a, a female athlete can come in and, and take that take the range and just run with it. That's a very astute observation, Michael, and I 100% agree. <laughs> Even with a Caitlin Clark shoe coming, you know, Paul George hasn't had one in a couple of years, so sliding right into that line too. Um, <laughs> now, starting the line, period, Nike. Any other brand is Cheryl Swoops from 1995 to 2002. Her line was the pioneer of women's basketball. The first WNBA athlete ever to have a signature shoe. Again, period. This end of the story. Um, the Air Swoops, the first one, definitely needs no introduction. That's everybody's. I like shoes for a long time shoe <laughs> to like bring up that they like. They did a retro a couple months, not a couple months. Damn, well, time's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago now, um, fire. I didn't buy them just because I have a trillion basketball shoes and don't need to wear them. But it's hard to deny the looks of the swoop. It's just such a unique Nike basketball shoe and just really a, un a unique shoe design period. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the best books on basketball sneakers in recent years is, ironically, A History of Basketball Sneakers. And I think the Air Swoops is one of the 15 sneakers that are mentioned in that. And it is going to be one of those things that the further we get removed from this, especially as we see our favorite female athletes get these signature shoes at a slightly easier rate than in years past, I'm hoping that further puts the Air Swoops into that hallowed ground of a Kobe four or a Jordan one, because it truly is kind of a Jackie Robinson type of shoe because it broke a barrier because not only was it a female shoe, it was a shoe that fellows were also trying to buy and get. So that's one of those things that as we kind of learn through that, we want to make sure that we are paying respect as we can. And her game probably has aged as well as a elder States woman's game can evolve in the NBA sense or rather the WNBA sense. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those shoes. I never had the shoe either. Um, I kind of remember, like, in passing, you know, being young when it first came out. Um, only thing, I mean, what I really associated with is the, the four-peat, the Houston Comets, you know, with, with Cheryl Swoop. So, I mean, 
legendary shoe. It can go down in basketball history. It doesn't matter, man, woman. Uh, so it's just, yeah. I think it's just one of those classics. Four Pete's insane, period. Um, I think you, you, you brought up the four Pete. Um, Cynthia Cooper, her teammate, also had a signature shoe with Nike in 1999. Um, I believe it was, it was her point guard, Cynthia Cooper, it was the point guard. I could be wrong. Two guards. Uh, th- That's right. that A guard is a guard is a guard. Yeah, right. Um, but nope. also, just Cheryl Swoops, keep in mind, was playing in a 90s, 2000 era where there was no heavy screening for three point shooting. You know, this her <laughs> game, she was such a ball. She could play in any era, right? That's kind of like the Michael Jordan, Kobe, Tim Duncan conversation where like they could play anywhere, anytime, any place. Their game is just flawless. Uh, Rebecca Lobo, first and only Reebok WNBA athlete to have a signature shoe. Um, I think Angel Reese is probably is likely going to change that within the next year. Um, getting drafted by Chicago. You kind of can't from Baltimore. That whole like her her East presence is so strong and you go all the way down to LSU. This is a big C around the side of the country. Just like, <laughs> like fans the and people stuff. who would support her. And being a Reebok athlete, I can't see why not. Rebecca Lobo was calling a lot of these games, calls a lot of games. Um, this an OG, I believe, for the Liberty. She's a center for the Liberty. Um, I saw her play in 1997. Fun fact. Anywho. <laughs> Rebecca Lobo, beast. No, I mean, and it's funny you mention Angel Reese, right? Because what has been one of the overwhelming narratives in men's sneaker culture? Big men don't sell sneakers. I am very interested to see, can Angel Reese do the opposite? Can big women, in the height sense, not, in the, not that there's anything <laughs> wrong with that. Uh, I knew I was going to get in trouble. Mean. Yeah, we knew what you meant. <laughs> Tall women. Yes, all women. All big, beautiful women, whether it be height, weight, or everything Tall. in between. Tall. T-A-L-L. But yeah. all works, too. All women. But. Yes. Welcome to feminist history. Um, anyway, my thought is this, right? Angel Reese is charismatic as a basketball player. She kind of leans into that villain role, much to her frustration, because I thought she played a beautiful game of basketball. I don't think there's anything villainous about her game, but people are tending to stereotype for obvious and unobvious reasons. But I do think she is in a perfect market. And the other comparison I always seem to get around Angel Reese, primarily based on her Baltimore heritage, is that of Carmelo Anthony. If she can have a Carmelo Anthony type of career, whether it be a hyper-efficient scorer or, more importantly, somebody that had a signature line that the more we get removed from it, the more underappreciated it feels. Because I think the Melo line has slowly been aging like a fine wine, ironically. So I think... If Angel Reese can have that type of career and her sneakers can have that type of career, then I think Reebok's got a good one. I'm sure they got something cooking up. I mean, with Shaq and AI heading that up and them actually, you know, I know Shaq personally going to, you know, seek out Angel Reese. I'm sure that they already have something cooking up. And I, I wouldn't be surprised that by season start, which I think summertime, right? Um, like June, We're July. We're like a month out. A month by Okay, I thought a little later. Something's telling me that by all star break for them, we'll we'll see something popped up. I know it takes a little while to actually build out a shoe. Yeah, I mean she's been an NIL athlete with them for a while, so could have already been there. Who knows? Could be. Could be. I mean she's really big with like you know the TikTok generation that loves skincare, hair. I mean all the little girls, people love that. So she's very much in the right circles, internet wise. So. Hoops, internet, Reebok, it's going to be good. Um, so another OG, another pioneer of the game, um, Lisa Leslie. Her shoe, everybody's probably seen her shoe, the Total Air 9, which was her sneaker number. Um, her jersey number, not her sneaker number. It was her sneaker number. But the um, Air Total 9, baller, Lux. I think all of us kind of like a quilted shoe deep down inside. Like a little, like, you know, quilt, you know, a little leather, a little embossed looking leather. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it. I've always liked it. It looks cool, man, on any shoe. But Lisa Leslie's one of like this, the true pillars of the game um, and help making it what it is today. She's she's everywhere. Lisa I don't Leslie doesn't need it. One. This is one I'm trying to like. I know ah. it says 98, so I'm like, I don't. I'm trying to place it. And I cannot remember this one to save my life. I don't think I've ever seen it in person that I can recall. Hey, least. no, that's a, happy to do that then. No, we are the sneaker day. And that's why we're the sneaker history or her story podcast. Can we actually change our name for this episode to be the sneaker her story? I'm really mad at thinking about that like 18 minutes ago. That's a really good idea. 
That's okay. Redo the, redo the intro. <laughs> we do it. No, but that's I what mean, the outro is for. But it, to your point as well, uh, Robbie, as well as Mike, she's always been one of those players that has transcended in her game. I guess before mm-hmm. there was a Brittany Griner, there was a Lisa Leslie because I think wasn't she the first one that was able to dunk in a game? And now, like, we've seen yes. it kind of evolve. And she was, if I remember my basketball history, and maybe I'm not remembering it correctly, but she was the quintessential 3-4. Like, she could float in between positions. There was a grace mm-hmm. to her game, and that's kind of what I always associate with her shoe as well. Now, I am interested to see, because it seems now, much like the men's game, the women's game is gravitating towards smaller shooters or pass-first types. So we haven't been able to see a transcendent four like that, with the exception of maybe Brianna Stewart, but I associate Stewie's game to be a little bit more powerful than graceful. I love you so much. She was a center. She's a big girl. Um, tall, six five. We need to stop saying that. But she was six five. But I mean, three time MVP, um, two time champion. Uh, she was she was the center though. She's a she, her and like Lobo would go oh, at that's each right. other. Yep. In, in a good way. Um, you gotta have you gotta have rivalries because you have New York versus L A. That was actually the first WNBA game ever. Was the Liberty at Sparks? I was at that game. <laughs> Fun fact. Fun fact about life. Um, was that the game? Dis- no, I was just going to ask, was, was yeah. that the game with the Chinese player from the Sparks who just kind of also became one of the unofficial breakout stars the first year? I have no idea because I was like eight years old at the time. Fair enough. <laughs> but I'm just jealous you were there. I was physically there. <laughs> I, I, I can't attest. Um, but, you know, of that same era, actually, more accurately, this athlete – and coach kind of transcends era because she's been around forever in the best way possible. Coach Dawn, right? Just won her sec- third NCAA okay. championship. Right. Yeah. She also had one of the cleanest basketball shoes of the late 90s, man. The S5 um, jersey number, last name paired up. You get a cool looking shoe. But I think Mike said it earlier, really close to the design of the shoe. Dawn was very hands on, which if you see her as a coach, checks out. Mm-hmm. I like this. It looks like really like Alpha, you know, it was the Alpha Project that reminds me of like all those like in that line of shoes, which 98, 99 kind of falls in line with that. Uh, them starting to do that. I, I again, this is one of the ones me being nine, 10 years old. I'm trying to recall it by personally, but it's a pretty sleek shoe. I, I think it's it, it falls in line with a lot of the things they were selling at the time for men as well. And the player I always kind of associate Don Staley with from the men's side is Allen Iverson, right? There was a grittiness to their game. They were both pound for pound the most elite guards of their era. And it's really nice to see her have success post-playing career into her coaching career. And I think it's one of those things that we may be seeing the blossoming of a Coach K type figure and Coach S for the women's game because – if I am a young girl, I want to play for Coach Stanley, uh, Staley now because of the fact that yeah. UConn seems to be the old and South Carolina seems to be the new. And she seems to be a player's coach. She seems to be the type that has as much of a intensity to her as she does a swag. And more importantly, there's a genuineness to her that we just don't see necessarily with our college coaches because – College coaches are kind of notorious for always trying to be the ultimate hype men and hype women for product. And she seems to really put her players first. Most definitely. Most definitely. I've got to agree to there. And she's going to just keep seeing success. Like, I, I, I don't see that, that train slowing down anytime soon. Um, so next up here, uh, we have uh, Nikki McRae, Washington Mystics. Uh, one of her teammates, actually. Um, also, Meek Holtzclaw, which... I believe Caitlin Clark beat her record. I think Meek had it previously. Yep. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm not wrong. I feel like um, Caitlin Clark takes down everybody's record. So if you were a prominent women's <laughs> basketball player in the 1990s and the early 2000s, Caitlin Clark probably has your record now. You no. have no record anymore. Like your record's gone. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I mean, I'm going to have to, I'm going to double check myself, but I'm pretty sure Meek had it for all time until <laughs> Caitlin Clark. Um, but she had a BB4, which is kind of like a riff off the Vince Carter variant, right? I mean, yeah. I know the yeah. BB4 wasn't particularly Vince's shoe, but it was. Um, they just called this the BB4 Meek. And then um, Nikki McRae, the first and only ever Fila athlete to have a women's basketball shoe. Just two random facts, a BB4 variant and the first ever women's Fila basketball shoe. That's, those are both kind of cool facts. Mm-mm. 
Yeah, I'll match a fun fact. Uh, Shamika Holtzclaw, I believe, was the first woman to be on the Slam cover. And it was the infamous 1999 mm. lockout. And she was wearing a Knicks jersey. And it was one of those things that uh, maybe it was coming back into the game from the lockout. But it was one of those what-if moments in the Marvel sense. That what if Shakeem, uh, Shamika Holtzclaw, probably the best college player of that time, went to the NBA as opposed to the WNBA. And now I'm trying to remember that cover and see if there was any sneakers to it. And the Nikki McRae thing to feel, it makes a lot of sense, right? And I don't remember her game too much, but I want to say there was a bit of Grant Hill there. So maybe that's why the feel of thing kind of jumps out. But I'll defer to Mike on any and all Washington Mystics news yes, front. Because that's what my knowledge is very deep at. No, not at all. Um, I, I only one I can remember is going to be the... The BB4. I remember seeing this one. I like the, I like the design. It's pretty cool. I mean, I mean, shocks were the technology was not real whatsoever. But I think it's a really cool design on the on the BB4s. Fila, I had never seen that shoe in my life. Uh, you couldn't tell me it was one thing, and I would have believed you. But um, yeah, no, that's cool. I didn't know she was the first and only female athlete to be our female basketball player. I should say to be with Fila. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, she also I think went three out of four while playing for Pat Summit in Tennessee. It's like. All, and that's what's just like so crazy about the women's game history is like if Wait, you go ahead. Was she was she part of the Tennessee team that went undefeated? Shamika yes. Holtzclaw, I thought was ninety six, ninety eight, and ninety nine. No, yes, yeah. the ninety eight, yeah. ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight. Duh, three consecutive. So the ninety eight team. Funny enough, don't want to sidebar too far, but Adidas came out with a crazy eight to commemorate them because that was their team shoe. I have this shoe floating around in the back somewhere, uh, but it's sort of Lady Vols for that undefeated season and winning the national championship. Um, and that's just another yeah. tidbit to women's basketball. There we go. <laughs> Her and Tamika Catchings played on the same Tennessee team at the same time. No wonder why okay. he went three in a row. That's insane. But also keep in mind, Stewie won four in a row. You can throw that out there. I mean, insane. this is kind of the ultimate, like, I I'm I'm the winner. I got four. Like you can't. No one's doing that right now. It's it's gonna it's gonna be hard to top that. And there's a couple ladies here still coming up who are damn near close. Um. So Diana Taurasi, historically a huge LeBron wearer, PE yeah. receiver, this baller. Um, kind of like the LeBron of the women's game. Um, but had the Nike Shocks ZT DT. Um, this another crazy That's a shock. career, right? No, I, I don't know why I said uh, shock on there. Um, oh, okay, but there's yeah, also the um, Air Max Tarasi. That's the one that you're, you're seeing in this image. Oh, okay. There you go. That makes sense. I should look at the semicolon. <laughs> it looks like LeBron, though, too. Um, but, I mean, her resume is absolutely – it's it's insane. Like You just got to go look up. Three-time champion. We can just start there. Three-time NCAA champion. That's happened a lot here. But yeah. crazy career. But Diana Tarasi – Towards the end of her longevity, probably at the tail end of her career right now, but still balling. Her still LeBron, balling. Okay, Go ahead, her, her LeBron ten PEs were some of my favorites uh, that are floating around out there. Just want to put that on the wing. I just her, her. I know she doesn't have her signature anymore, but her LeBrons are extremely just nice. Like every last one of them. <laughs> Now, I know we kind of talked to her co-host and teammate about keeping Sue Bird fresh, but Diana was fresh before Sue was in that sense. So, I mean, I mm -hmm. hope that we get maybe a retro, especially the way they're going at LeBron retros. Maybe we'll get a Taurasi retro 10 in the future. But mm -hmm. to me, the other thing that kind of gets brought up with Diana Taurasi is obviously Diana Taurasi, the sports commentator. And I just get that Dr uh, Draymond Green quote of, they don't love you like that, <laughs> Diana. Like <laughs> the amount of saltiness that this young woman had towards Caitlin Clark. And it's been one of those things where Tarasi is a lot of people's goats because to Robbie's point, her accomplishments are going to stump you over the head with it. But at the same time, there feels like there is a little bit of a resentment there. And to the point that Robbie made in our pre-production meeting, it's one of those things that maybe she felt constrained given the system that she was playing in where those UConn teams were a constellation of stars, whereas mm -hmm. Iowa is very much a one-woman team. So Caitlin Clark had to do a lot of the table setting as well as the eating. So, yeah, uh, it's one of those things that I kind of find fascinating that slightly I know college women's basketball is now slowly making it because now the toxicity of men's sports is so slowly seeping into the women's game as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like it's one of those old guards can't handle the new guards coming in because I um, mean, we'll see. Like I say, we just got a, a month or so before the uh, before tip off. And Robbie said earlier, there's going to be a learning curve, of course, for anyone going into a professional league. But the way these 
young women playing now coming out of college, it is it's a different game. I mean, they're like they're they're free to fire away and take these Steph Curry range shots. They're they're getting more physical in the paint. They're becoming more positionless, like the men's game. So, I mean, Dunn and Trossi will always have her accolades, but it's, don't be salty. Just let let the game evolve. You want to be the person to help the game evolve. Don't don't try to hold it back. I mean, I don't think she's doing that. I'm looking at it, this flabbergasted um, Russia champion, EuroLeague champion, Turkish champion, NCAA. Like, very much like Caitlin Clark can pass and score. Diana Taurasi has led the WNBA in assists and scoring. So it's it's, it's wild. Um, so if anybody can talk any crap, it's like MJ, no one no one questions when MJ talks. She's on that kind of level in her game. But last <laughs> but not least, another Chicago native. Um, and ace my Las Vegas aces um, former player I think she's fully retired she was doing kind of both for a little bit I could be wrong Candace Parker Adidas again the first female to have a basketball shoe the ace versatility um, Adidas ace commander and the ace versatility two different shoes cool kind of like on the court off the court a little vibe going on but um that line didn't do very – that one didn't catch on because I remember that came and that was a oil in a pan type situation. They pushed that marketing pretty hard, and I don't see it go anywhere well, now. Well, they moved her now to the Exhibit A. Is that the shoe now that she yeah. wears? Yeah. Uh, so they, they kind of moved over to – it is a team shoe for everybody, but they really kind of focus it towards the women, I feel like, and she's the face of that particular sneaker. She's a baller. I mean, I love oh, yeah. Candace Parker. I, I, she's the, great on TV, too. That's what I was yeah. going to say. She, yeah, she is, is slowly becoming the... I know maybe I make the comment that she is Doris Burke, but I was going to say she's become the John Madden in, of the women's game as well as the men's game, right? Because she's yeah. equally confident in commenting both. on both aspects of the sport. And she's synonymous with her buddy Shaquille O'Neal. So, I mean, I'm sure that's a very calculated move. And I think as we're kind of looking at women branching out, not only in a post-court life, but... Yeah, she's an analyst the same way Staley's a coach, and she's a damn good one at that. I'm very interested to see how that inspires the future generation of players that want to have higher aspirations than just basketball once it's all said and done. Yep. Yeah, well, also still being an absolute champion and beast. Oh, and, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just so crazy. Well. Every player, I mean, not to be mean to the boys, but every women's player who has a signature shoe has like Rezu Maze, Devin Booker's maiden. Western Conference. I made a W. Uh, made an NBA Finals. That's like his credential. <laughs> and and nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. Stray just now. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not I was wondering too. if you guys had recast a Joanna Man sequel that I heard nothing about. With the anyway, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, even Luca too, right? I'm mean, like, oh, you made a Western Conference Finals. You have two, three going on signature shoes. Nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. But Candace Parker. It's just one of, I think she has one of the, the lighter resumes while still having like a heavy resume. Well, <laughs> Sabrina, like, we can't, we'll say Sabrina has a lighter, probably a lightest resume, but she still has made a final within her first, what well, she's been in elite two, two seasons, years, three she, years. She's made a final is like, I mean, I mean, again, sorry, Devin Booker. Sorry, Luke, you're catching these, but you haven't even sniffed the finals yet. Like yeah. every woman on this list is accomplished in some way or form. And I mean, you, you can't, when you put the resume up against it, if you're just going, you know, bar for bar, it's like, all right, well, they, they've done something to deserve the shoe. Facts. I'm going to be like J. Cole, and I'm just going to say, hey, guys, my spirit just wasn't clean after this episode, and I respect Luca and Devin. But no, it, it is what it is. I mean, I do think that when you're comparing the goats of the women's game, the ring culture is amplified and then some because to the yeah. point that my co-host made, there's the Olympics, there's high school, there's college, and then there's the international game and they're playing simultaneously. So it is something to be hold. And then also they have the added pressure of being a mom or wanting to have other extracurricular activities. So kudos to the ladies. It's always lady night here at a uh, sneaker history podcast. Yeah. Could not agree more. Um, a lot of killer shoes though. A lot of assassins on the court. Um, go buy a pair of Sabrinas. You know, go buy a pair of Candace Parkers. Go go support. Go buy a jersey. Help the sport. Be positive. Be nice. There you go. Respect the history. A lot of ballers out there. It's not but history. To, it's her story. Her story. Um, thanks so much for tuning in with us and spending a half an hour of your day. Make sure you check all of us out on our internet platforms you can find us on. 
link in description to find those. Make sure you like, tell a friend, leave a comment. Leave some comments. Leave a smoke signal. I don't care. Something, y'all. Something. Help us out. But uh, no, we appreciate (laughs) you and have a good rest of your day. Hey, hey, Nick here again. Before you take off, I want to thank you for listening to the Sneaker History Podcast. Be sure to hop into our Discord to answer this episode's The Last Shot question and get to know our community of sneaker enthusiasts. If you'd like more insights on the trending topics in the sneaker world, I've also recently started a newsletter to share my knowledge from nearly two decades of experience working in the footwear industry. You can find the link to that below or go to sneakerhistory.com slash newsletter. And last but not least, tell someone you like their kicks today. You never know how far a simple compliment can take you, and we all know how good it feels to be on the receiving end of some appreciation. Thank you for all the support, and we will catch you on the next episode. Peace.